Hello and welcome to the unit where we will explain the different existing methods to determine the irreversibilities that appear during the voltage generation of a fuel cell. Through the equivalent model of the fuel cell, it is possible to determine for each point of operation which are the mechanism of losses that occur. There are different techniques to determine the value of each of the components of the equivalent model. The simplest simplest and most economical technique is the current interruption method. This method can be used when the current density does not reach values where concentration losses can appear. Most fuel cells avoid reaching this area because of the significant drop in efficiency that occurs and because the electrolyte that suffers. The, techniques, the technique consists in knowing the current that generates the fuel cell in a certain point of operation interrupting this current abruptly and seeing in the oscilloscope which is the evolution of the voltage. We can see this evolution in the figure. From the characteristic curve we know that when the fuel delivers current the voltage is lower than when it is in an open circuit. Therefore the voltage will initially be that of the operating point and when the current is suddenly cut the voltage will grow. The first voltage range corresponds to the ohmic losses, while the second range corresponds to the activation losses. When the current is interrupted, the voltage drop that was occurring at the RR resistor disappears instant instantaneously, since the processes that give rise to this voltage drop are poorly load carrying through conductors. Therefore, if the loads disappear, the effect disappears. Thanks to the curve obtained in the oscilloscope, we can know the potential different delta mu r. From this value, we can calculate the value of the resistance r, r of the model by simply dividing delta mu r by the current that was circulated in the load at the time of the interruption. However, the voltage in the capacitor that models the effect of the double charging layer doesn't disappear instantaneously because it must be discharged on the model's resistor RA. The initial value of the capacitor voltage is precisely the voltage drop that occurred at the RA resistance when the current was circulating. Therefore, the voltage increase from the moment the voltage RR disappears until it reaches the sta stable current of the final voltage allows calculating the value of the resistance RA in the same way that we have calculated RR. The equation that defines the voltage discharge of the capacitor uh, on the resistor is the one shown in the slide, where the product of RA times CA is the time constant of the discharge. In the graph, that time constant can be found from the instant in which the current is interrupted until the value of 63% of delta mu A is reached, measured from the voltage at which the discharge begins. Finally, from the measured value of the time constant and knowing the value of uh, RA, the value of CA of the capacitor can be calculated. With these last values, we have now all the elements of the model. In this slide, we can see a simulation made with the ORCAD program of the waveforms of an equivalent circuit. We can therefore see the values of the components of the model and the results of applying the calculation procedure described above. As it can be seen, the values obtained are very close to the real value, although as it is a graphic method, it presents some discrepancies, especially in the calculation of the capacitor. Electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS, is a much more complex technique than the previous one, but also more precise. It is based on the behavior of capac capacitive elements at different frequencies of sinusoi sinusoidal signals. There are different ways of doing the analysis, for example, applying sinusoidal voltage signal to the operating fuel cell and seeing the response in the current. Another way is as is the case shown in the figure, varying the current delivered by the fuel cell when it is at, as, at a given operating point and checking how the voltage behaves. In this case, to the current that is consuming the load, 
which is a direct, a direct current because it is the one generated by the fuel cell, a sinusoidal current is added which is consumed by the EIS meter device. The equipment measures the current be being injected and the voltage generated by the fuel cell and compares the measurements of both magnitudes. The current consumed by the EIS meter device must have a particular characteristic. It must have a positive offset greater than the amplitude of the sinusoidal signal IP so that no current can, can ever be drawn from the fuel cell. In addition, the amplitude of the current must not be so great as to remove the fuel cell from its point of operation. In other words, the amplitude of the sinusoidal signal will be much smaller than the value of the direct current I load. The time this current is applied depends on the frequency being used. Since for frequency lower than 0.01 Hz, its period is 100 seconds and in, or in order to ensure a stable measurement, the current signal must be applied for a sufficient number of periods. The maximum frequency is usually 20 kHz, which implies a period of 500 microseconds. As sufficient, sufficiently reliable measurement must be made to be able to calculate both the voltage amplitude and the voltage current offset, the sampling frequency of the measurement equipment must be at least 10 times higher. Therefore, the sampling period will be 50 microseconds. With the values of voltage and current amplitude, it is possible to calculate the impedance module and also the phase of the impedance through the phase shift between the signals. If we consider the double loaded layer of the anode and the cathode together, we can continue to use the previous model. Taking into account the frequency behavior of the capacitive impedance, it is easy to deduce the total impedance calculation from the set omega association, which will have a real part and an imaginary part. From the measurement made on voltage and current, the parameter zone can be obtained. From the relationship between amplitudes, we can obtain the modulus of the impedance and knowing the, the phase and the, module and the modulus, the real part of the impedance and the imaginary part can be calculated. These values can be now represented, represented either in a Nyquist diagram or in a Bode diagram. In the Nyquist diagram, the real part of the impedance for each frequency is placed on the x-axis. On the other hand, the imaginary part with negative sign is placed on the y-axis in order to make it posit positive as the capacitor introduces a negative imaginary part and it is also dependent on the frequency. As for the Bode diagram, the modulus of impedan imp impedance uh, and phase versus frequency is presented. Each of these uh, diagrams are useful for calculating certain types of irreversibilities. In the case of the Nyquist diagram, if we consider the simple model we have been working with, also called the Rundle cell, in the representation of the real part in the x-axis and the imaginary part in the y-axis, different critical points can be found. Firstly, the representation is usually a semicircle. When very high frequencies are considered, the capacitive impedance becomes practically a short circuit. So, at those frequencies, the air A is short circuit and the resulting impedance is only the part of the air air resistor. We can see it here on the left of the diagram. On the other hand, when the frequency is very low, the, capac the capacitive impedance is practically an open circuit, so that the total impedance is the sum of R, R and R A. We can see that in the right part of the diagram where it is clear that the distance uh, between the two cuts with the real part for the imaginary zero part is the R A itself. Finally, we can also measure from the diagram what is the maximum imaginary impedance. This maximum point can be obtained by der deriving the expression of the imaginary part with respect to the frequency and then equaling to zero. 
The result is that the pulse at which um, the maximum imaginary part is produced is 1 over Ra uh, times Ca. And therefore, as we have the frequency at which the imp this impedance has been produced, we can calculate directly the value of Ca. If we use the same example as, as that used for the current interruption method, the resulting Nyquist diagram is that of the figure. We can see now that the right part is 20, which cor corresponds uh, to R, R, R. The, sorry, the left part, the right part is uh, 100, which corresponds to the sum of R, R and R, A, and that the pulse at which the maximum impedance is produced is 12.56 radians, so that the CR results in 1 uh, millifarad. However, in this case, the boat diagram does not provide additional information. We can see this time the uh, air R resistance at high frequencies and the sum of the two resistors at low frequencies. But the maximum impedance pulsation remains in a poorly identifiable place. Therefore, when is the boat diagram useful? The boat diagram is used to calculate the value of the so-called warbore impedance. This impedance is used to model the mass transfer mechanisms that are related to concentration losses. The previous losses were related to load transfer phenomena and didn't allow the modeling of this type of losses. Now, this impedance is associated with the resistance RA and the capacity CA of activation losses and its effects can be see, seen at very low frequencies. Warbus impedance in the model is phase, phase fixed and therefore appears as a 45 degrees straight line when the frequency starts to become very small, as we can see in the figure. Perhaps in that part of the diagram it is not so simple to make the measurement of the value of each impedance and it may be easier to do it in the boat diagram. In our example from the boat diagram we obtain that for a pulse of 0.01256 radians, the modulus of the impedance is 1 151.35 ohms and from there we can calculate an AW of value uh, of a value of 5.0001 ohms per second to the power of 0.5. AW is related to the diffusion coefficient D and the concentration C of the oxidant O and the reducer, the reducer R, R as we can see in this equation. For each point of the polarization curve, the test can be performed to determine the percentage of participation of each irreversibility in the voltage drop. As we can see in the figure, for low current densities, the greatest losses are caused by the effect of the activation potential. On the other hand, in the intermediate values, the losses due to the proton resistance of the membrane of a pin fuel cell have the same weight as the other two phenomena. Finally, at high current densities, it is the concentration losses that contrib contribute a higher percentage of losses, as expected from the deduction made at the beginning of the unit. However, when this method is used, its limitation must be taken into account. Firstly, the amplitude of the disturbance current must not bring the system out of the steady state. In other words, the amplitude must be much smaller than the current delivered by the source. In addition, the test must be performed under the, same, under the same condition of current density, temperature, presence of reactants, etc. to be valid. This is especially difficult when testing at very low frequency because the testing times are very low. With this, we conclude the unit about the different exist existing methods to determine irreversibilities in the voltage generation in a fuel cell. Thank you very much for your attention.